Good morning from the capital Kampala. Thank you all for joining us and we're happy. Thank you Makere University for hosting us and we're really excited to have all of you here. Good morning Africa, good morning world. In this conversation will be looking at the new players. I'll, I'll start the conversation off with just a short story. I've been meeting a couple of people over the last couple of months and and I think the most recent was a team of Germans who came in and we had lunch and we talked about so many things. After that, I, will, I told them, welcome to Uganda, thank you for coming. They're like, but Solomon, Africa is the future. Everyone is looking Africa. And I have had an opportunity of talking to different nationalities. Literally, everyone is focusing Africa. We already have the players who have been with us for quite a while, and we all know them. But Africa is, look, the people who are rediscovering Africa in a more passionate way. I'll give you an example. If any one of you has been at the African Union headquarters in Addis, you cannot miss this, the big screens there from the reception to different offices, and the television station that they're switched on is CGTN, which, of course, is the international cable network for the Chinese government. If you've been on the streets of Lagos, there are satellite dishes everywhere and you know, a couple of set of boxes, yellow in color. We have that same in Uganda. Star Times, right? How many of us have Star Times in our, in our, in our homes? Very many. It's taking over. Makere University recently introduced a language called Chinese. And the Chinese government is sponsoring different students to take on Chinese. Am I right? Yeah, School of Languages. Every year, there's a team of journalists that is given tours to China and sponsorships every year. Most of them are, some of them are journalists. Now, if you happen to look at the new vision over the last two weeks, you'll not miss an article by one of the Ugandan journalists who is there and speaking good about China and China's involvement on the continent and in Uganda. I can go on and on and on. What that tells you is that there is a deliberate move by new players to have a big footprint in Africa, directly or indirectly. Now, that is not only in media, by the way. There are external powers like Russia, China, Turkey, who look like they're new players because we all know that the people who colonized all of us have been here. The English, the Germans, the Portuguese, they've been here. Looks like many of the African governments are now looking at the East rather than the West. We all know that ringtone by President Museveni when he's praising China. Do we know that? Imagine now it's becoming a ringtone. Am I speaking to someone? Yeah. Where he says, China, oh, 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 oh. They have really been our good friends. There's so many new players. Africa has now become a place where everyone wants to have a bite of it. So what does this mean for us? And is there more than meets the eye? Precisely today, we're having a conversation around that subject. And I would love to make it as easy as I can for all of us to understand and debate and have conversations. And today, today's topic is strategies and influence of new actors in Africa. And we'll pay particular attention to Russia, China, Turkey, because they're the current big boys. And I thought that we could start this conversation with Dr. Stefan Frederick, who is the head of Department Sub-Saharan Africa at the CAS headquarters. CAS has particularly done several studies on this subject, and I think their recent release was on how these new players are taking over Africa's media. It's content that you can find on the CAS website, and I had an opportunity of reading 
part of it. But Dr. Stephen, if you could just ground us in what have been the key findings from the studies that you have conducted and why is CAS really interested in this topic? Dr. Stephen, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Solomon. And um, um, I'm very glad to be, to be part of, of uh, the Kampala Geopolitics uh, Conference. I heard so much about it, and now it's good to be part of it. Um, thank you very much. However, actually, I wish to be there in person. So maybe next year. Um, well, <clears throat> to your question, Solomon, the world is changing. And after the end of the Cold War and the unification of Germany and Europe in 1990, it seemed that the world was developing towards democracy worldwide. More and more countries moved in that direction. And that trend was something that the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung welcomed very much. We are an institution for which the promotion of democracy is a core value. However, this trend towards democratization of the 1990s and 2000s experienced changes over the last uh, six to 10 years. And that had lots to do with, A, the, re uh, the re-emergence of Russia, not as a constructive global power, but rather as a disruptive, deconstructive power, seen particularly in the seizure of Crimea, in 2014, forcefully changing the borders in Eastern Europe, something that we thought would, wouldn't happen anymore. The whole involvement of Russian actors in East Ukraine and or Russia's involvement in the Syrian civil war and others. And secondly, it is connected to the rise of the People's Republic of China, not only as an economic powerhouse, but more and more as a systemic challenge to the trend of democratization and to Western democracies. China is not a democracy. It is a communist country, and it wants to expand its influence worldwide and to reduce and wants to reduce the pressure from the outside to move towards democracy by promoting its own system which is authoritarian and becomes more and more authoritarian day by day. The world now is, that's how we see it, in the middle of a systemic rivalry. Western democracies on the one hand and rising authoritarian countries on the other hand. And one key area for this rivalry is Africa. You mentioned quite a, a number of um, elements where this uh, rivalry also unfolds. There are different arenas uh, like economics, IT infrastructure, development aid, media, political parties, military support, corona diplomacy. Particularly on the last four areas, we commissioned a series of research papers and studies focusing on China, but sometimes also on other actors like Russia and Turkey. Uh, for example, uh, on the media sector, we, commission, uh, we published a study. It is
question we are, we are supposed to ask ourselves and comes down to one simple thing, Solomon. It is money, money, money. Um, when, when we talk about money, it's, it's like everything, you know, when Africans think about money, we just, we just think like money is the solution to everything. But at the same time, you're losing like our values, you're losing our resources uh, in the process. So that is exactly what happened. And um, yeah, China is busy establishing itself as a global uh, news uh, you know, they want that presence in Africa, and I think it's there. And also to make it, you know, greater for them, you know, most of their channels are free to air. Like uh, when you go to your Star Times dish, if all the channels have disappeared and you haven't paid, be sure that CGT and Africa will still be showing on that platform. So that is just a, what you can see, how the agenda they want to push across all platforms. So that is China. And then we have, uh, you know, uh, TRT World, uh, that is the Turkish... Uh, the Turkish channel and now they have actually last year they came up with the new African program dedicated to Africa they have 30 minutes of that it's being presented by a lady from Nigeria and you can tell now they are very interested as I had their doctor saying uh, the Turkish president was also in Africa just doing his uh, you know visit but also behind that you know just to say you know we are supporting we have this and you can imagine how that was being broadcasted to the people in Turkey through TRT world we also even have India with the Z network you know we We've seen how they are now hiring anchors from Africa to go uh, talk to the Indians over there to go tell them more about Africa. We have Russia's RT. So we can see the emergence of these new actors who I know the doctor is saying, are they really new actors? Uh, they're not new actors in terms of maybe investment and other fields, but in, in the media field, uh, we consider them here in Africa as new actors because we're used to the BBC, we're used to the CNN, we're used to the New York Times. Um, but I can still say BBC is still unmatched. The old dog BBC is still unmatched because most of our journalist training, journalistic training, uh, the, the rules and everything we have learned from Western media. So there's that still uh, strong presence of the BBC, the CNN, and people trusting the stories that are putting out there on the continent. Also, another thing that might be of, cla that clashes with so many journalists is uh, there has been this um, story out there where people say China paints a positive picture on TV, on mainstream media, uh, when it comes to Africa. Well, uh, the likes of BBC, the likes of CNN, the likes of France 24 uh, tend to, especially during elections, tend to paint that negative side uh, when it comes. So there's still that, um, you know, that back and forth, people trying to establish who's saying the truth, how does it need to be done? Do we need to hide a bit? Uh, like, you know, when you're reporting for this, maybe the Chinese uh, media stations, or do we need to go out there and say what is on the ground, really what is happening to other Africans? Uh, you know, when you see there on the BBC, when you see there on the CNN. So it's quite, quite, a, quite a topic, I must say, Solomon, quite a topic. And, um, all and but most of the time what i can say when i was at cgtn what we broadcasted is definitely the achievements of the chinese government back home in china and their work in africa there was no highlighting of issues like racism or workers right and all that so a bit of fairness public accountability um that is independence was 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 kind of out the door and sean we, we've seen journalists from all over africa being given scholarships to go to china you want to comment on that? Is it also happening in, 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 um, in Kenya? Yes, yes. Uh, once you get there, uh, they, there's always a training that you go to Beijing. You get to go to the main big offices there and see. And you know, and you know when it comes to China, the technology and the money is real. So even when you go to Beijing, you actually get shocked. It's something you've never seen before uh, when growing up in Africa. But then you get to see that and you get to be like, well, maybe, maybe they're working for the, for, for, the, for the continent. But the truth is not everything is reported out there. It has to, there's an agenda Agenda, and you have to follow that agenda. If you try to do it your own way as a journalist, I'm sorry, um, just get ready to, to be fired. But yes, there are, there are many journalists year in, year out. Let me say like dozens, like 50 or 60 each year who have to be flown to Beijing to be trained, you know, if it's print, if it's radio, if it's TV, they're, they're always there. Thank you, Sean. We'll come back to you, including, by the way, Uganda here. And uh, we've seen so many journalists being taken to China literally all the time. And um, can I say I was one of them, by the way? <laughs> I was one of them. Um, and this goes to um, my next question, because when I went, 
the Chinese government sponsored my trip to go and cover the CPC, Communist Party of China, often has um, the annual Communist, the China uh, Africa, part of the China Africa Convention. They, they get um, political parties who are in power um, in Africa and bring them, um, and they have conversation with the Communist Party of China in a, a five-day whole convention where they commit to support governments in power. And at that moment, of course, it was the National Resistance Movement Party that went to represent government. And I was, you know, I, I covered the whole event and they committed huge sums of money. And that means that they become part of the establishment. They become part of, you know, of the regime. We know that the Communist Party of China has supported the National Resistance Movement Party here in Uganda even during the elections. Um, that, that one, I know that I have evidence to that, that it has really been behind um, a big support to the National Resistance Movement Party. And, 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 and I just wanted to, <laughs> to, to, to bring back the conversation to whether indeed it's, is it the development agenda that authoritarian regimes are pushing for, or is there more than meets the eye? And I want to bring in, um, you know, I think Raymond, I should bring you in before uh, we go back um, virtual. Is there more than meets the eye in this? Raymond, we have seen huge investments, for example, of China, uh, and, and, and Uganda's debt burden, and indeed Africa's debt burden, has significantly grown. They are pushing that we are interested in the development of the country. We are interested in infrastructure development. We're interested in pushing you out, and perhaps that's why the African leaders are falling for that bait, and yet they may be more than meets the eye, Raymond. Um, Solomon, I wanted to say from the onset that um, it's a dangerous intellectual voyage to imagine that uh, there's nothing more than meets, there's no more than meets the eye. It's truly dangerous. And one of the quickest ways, as an example, to show you um, this, um, we have an election that's going to happen in, in Kenya in the next year. And one of the key factors in that election is the debt burden contracted by the development agenda of Kenya. And that majority of that debt burden is actually caused by the Chinese government lending towards the Kenyan government. Yeah. Now, we have to ask ourselves, um, and again, this is a matter of, of control of the African elite. I hear many people saying China is the biggest lender to Africa. China is not even the third biggest lender to Africa. There's a lot of multilateral aid that allows African countries to operate without control that comes from the European Union, France, Germany here. Um, there's a lot of aid that comes to Africa from countries like India, which is in, in health forms and, and the like. But the aid that specifically comes from China is, is very pegged and very tagged. Even the, the, the idea of we are innocent businessmen, we are your friends trying to do business. No, there's nothing. We are not friends. We're not trying to do any business with each other. China is taking sand from, from Uganda at very low cost, um, taking it to China and manufacturing tiles from there. Um, China is leading in capital flight from Africa, um, just as are many multinational com companies doing here. So there's more than meets the eye. There is, of course, like I told you, a general consensus that there must be a control of Africa because it's the next barrier of development. These economies that we treasure, the European Union economies, the United States economy, the Chinese economy, they've reached what you call satiety point. They can't grow any further. So their only growth is outward, so they have to come towards Africa for them to realize some level of growth and development. And, and this is where I'm particularly angry with Dr. Philip, because one of the questions he asked was, where is the African agency? But the African agency is these universities. This is where the African agency was trained from. Down the road there is a hall called Nkuruma. That hall isn't called Nkuruma because Nkuruma was the president of Ghana. It's called Nkrumah because he had the consciousness of Africanness with him. And that consciousness has progressively died in, in, in our universities, and it's being progressively killed even by the elites in, in, in these universities, some of the more lecturers. So we've got to ask ourselves important questions. The first and more important question is, do we want authoritarian states in Africa? And I think that the answer is no because we've lived under the yoke of authoritarianism in Africa for years. 
people get butchered, personal freedoms get taken away, um, control of mass media, control of the economy, large-scale corruption, tribalism, all those are effects that come with authoritarianism. On the other hand, there's this thing called democracy. It's not perfect, but it guarantees that a lot of people take part in the affairs of their government. And the more that you have more people take part in the affairs of their government, then you, you term a level of consciousness within those people. Um, and, and that is where we need to have a conversation. The conversation on how can we redefine democracy in Africa to work for Africa, uh, yes, whilst all the, in the same manner, rejecting all this new level of authoritarianism that's coming up. Um, Solomon, the other thing that I want to talk about is, is um, I had someone on the panel mention that there's soft power that these authoritarian regimes are, are coming with. I had to break it to you, they have had power too. The guns that you see the Uganda police force having on the streets, those are AK-47s manufactured in Russia, paid for by the Chinese government. The coup d'etats that you're seeing, they are being emboldened. The, the people carrying out coup d'etats are being emboldened by authoritarian regimes. They are providing them intelligence on political opponents. They are providing them with weapons with which to kill uh, their opponents. They are providing them with intelligence on how to kill their own democracies. They're providing them with even worksmiths. Um, Huawei Technologies has been involved in a lot of hacking allegations in African elections. Who is the owner of Huawei? The Chinese government. Who sits on the boards of the Huawei uh, company? People who sit in the CPC who make decisions for the Chinese government. So there's nothing like soft power. And actually, yeah. there's actual hard raw power. And it is seen. It's just that we don't have the platforms within which to take over African consciousness yeah. in a way that we elaborate these things. And for me, the quickest answer to African agency is the people in this room. You have people who are in this room interested in this conversation, and after this conversation, they'll have conversations with other people. Yeah. And once those conversations continue to happen, you have a, a, a growth of African consciousness. I love what you're saying. <laughs> Raymond Mujuni, thank you. While you are speaking, you know, I... I, I, I as an investigative journalist, I've discovered that there are conversations going on for the Chinese government to take over Entebbe International Airport, the cargo area. Why? Because we're heavily indebted. That one I can speak with uh, authority that it's happening. These conversations are going on. The Minister of Finance is having conversations. They wanted, the Minister of Finance is trying to convince the Chinese government to take over, you know, traffic. And they have put their foot down that they want to take over cargo. And, and that is deep. But at what cost? The, the people in, in this government, uh, government of Uganda think, if we do the Entebbe Expressway, people will use the road and we will pay for it. And we'll have the infrastructure there. Whilst we have to pay the loan, but it is there and we are developing it. It will help the economy to grow. We manufacturing, we, 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 it will help our manufacturing sector. If we improve infrastructure, then the development will continue. Let me come to Dr. Stephen. You talked about this as being destructive, disruptive and destructive, to, so, to say the least when you're giving your remarks. I wanted you to expound on that, because there are two parts of the coins, Dr. Stephen, here. Development versus authoritarianism. Your thoughts? Thank you very much, uh, Solomon. Uh, before, before answering that question, I, I really would like to, to comment on, on what uh, the other panelists uh, said. I, I really want to, 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 um, uh, to say that I very much agree with Raymond um, in terms of what he said about soft power and hard power. And hard power doesn't come with soldiers anymore. Hard power comes, comes uh, with economic pressure or economic power. And, and I think it's very important to, 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 uh, to underline this. And, um, and the Chinese do have the, 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 the power in their hand uh, uh, currently. And um, also to, to Sean, um, when, you, when you mentioned about working for, for the Chinese uh, CGTN. I mean, 
if you have to throw all your principles out of the window to journalistic principles, that that's a tough sell. I mean, um, and and that is what I meant with uh, <clears throat> with uh, they are influencing and they are pressuring uh, journalists and, and, and so on. And that is something um, that goes contrary to what we see as democratic uh, development. And um, I also have to comment on what Dr. Phillips said, and I think especially in a, in a university context, I can't <laughs> let that stand there. If you argue that uh, China is a democracy and Russia is a democracy, well, I lived six years altogether as a student and later uh, as a representative of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. I lived in Shanghai and in China. And um, I know that it is not a democracy. Uh, and um, they do, in, <laughs> I, get, I grant it, they do have uh, local elections, but uh, the question is, who are you allowed to elect and uh, uh, is the, are these free and fair elections? And I have to say no. And the same holds true for Russia at the moment. And um, I mean, they do have elections, but if you, if you really follow uh, how these elections are conducted and how uh, opposition parties, and uh, let's take only the, the case of uh, the opposition uh, person, Navalny, uh, how they are treated. I mean, um, to, to talk about Russia as a true uh, democracy, well, I, I do have uh, serious doubts about it. And I think um, this is, um, uh, is it that, well, if we, if we start discussing or, well, uh, arguing about uh, whether uh, China is a democracy or not, then uh, we already have gone a long way. And maybe that's also one success of, the, of uh, China telling its own narrative, because it is uh, the Chinese narrative that they call themselves uh, a, a democracy, uh, but, well, it, not according to our standards. Maybe uh, we are not in a position to, to set the standards, but um, it, it is something that, that um, where we um, have a quite clear definition what a true democracy is, and uh, China certainly is not that. And there I come to the, the question of destructiveness. I mean, um, um, <clears throat> it, it is, I mean, if you, if you look at, at the situation uh, now, for example, very, very current uh, situation, uh, the, the stress that uh, Europe has at the Belarusian border at the moment. Uh, you certainly heard that there are lots of refugees from, from the Middle East that are trying to enter uh, uh, Poland, to cross the border of, of Poland uh, from Belarus. And how that, does that happen? How do these people get to Belarus? They are flown in from uh, 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 Syria, from uh, Iraq, from uh, Iran, uh, over Turkey to, uh, to Minsk. And then they are brought by government uh, troops or government soldiers. They are accompanied to the, the, the European border. And uh, the, the reason for this is that, um, that they want to destabilize the European Union by uh, pushing more and more uh, refugees to the European border and make trouble for, uh, for uh, the European Union. And I do not believe, it's my personal opinion, but I do not believe that this is being done on the will of only President Lukash, uh, Lukashenko of, uh, of Belarus. It must be with the support and uh, the, the approval by Kreml and uh, by uh, uh, President Putin. And, and this is something uh, what, what I call destructive because it is, it is just a, the, uh, an essay 
to try to uh, to destabilize uh, the, uh, the European Union. And uh, this is something which is an example which is not related to Africa, but the point is that uh, that these kind of actions we meet everywhere uh, and uh, not only in, uh, in, in in Europe but also elsewhere in the world. Can, can I just come in here, uh, Dr. Stefan? When you look at, um, and you're talking about destructive here, when you look at the money that comes from the so-called authoritarian regimes, and that's including China and Russia, it doesn't have a lot of, you know, a lot of attachments, and very many international, uh, very many African, African presidents and governments have embraced that sort of funding um, as, as opposed to the funding that often comes from the EU, you know, the Germans and the British and the Americans. And because of the past and the way the West has treated several African governments pretty much by dictating on them what and how they should run their governments, vis-a-vis -vis the East, and that's Russia, China, and Turkey in this case, that say, you know what, we're not interested in the way you govern your people, we're interested in your development, and the money that we're giving you, use it well to develop your people. Of course, some of it is grants, some of it is loans, and somewhat, most of the African government have fallen for this money and for this relationship, and they're focusing their attention away from the West and they're closely eyeing the East and therefore bringing them closer. And this is why our head of state is, has used international platforms before during big, inter, big national events to say, you know, those guys are the worst people in the world and then applauding the East. This is, this is where it is coming from, you know. Um, do you want to mention? Do you want to say something about that? I I, I totally agree, and uh, you are absolutely right. This is a is a huge challenge also for um, Western development aid. Chinese development aid very often uh, emphasizes on large scale infrastructure development. We uh, mentioned in the debate already the AU uh, uh, headquarters or uh, government. Uh, um, uh, buildings in, in Uganda uh, or the railway between Nairobi and Mombasa, very often it closes a gap which is also caused by, caused by Western donors' focus on poverty reduction, education and, and health. And China's economic aid is mainly in the form of, of cheap loans, usually without open, and I, I have to underline this, open uh, conditionalities and it does not ask questions about democracy and human rights and that's for for some leaders this is very appealing uh, but to be sure China's economic uh, aid comes also with conditionalities and uh, you have to uh, to accept for example China's uh, claim that Taiwan is part of the PRC or uh, you uh, are forced or invited to vote uh, with China in multilateral uh, fora such as the UN. And, uh, and here you, you, you will see that uh, there are uh, quite a few uh, strings attached also to, to the Chinese uh, development aid. But it's not as open and transparent uh, as the, the strings attached uh, that come with uh, uh, Western um, aid. And um, what, what the West is trying to do is to uh, help to improve the livelihood of the people on the ground uh, in, in these countries. And the Chinese in their uh, development aid uh, that is not, to put it this way, that is not their uh, first priority. Dr. Stephen, thank you. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to some views and context from people. And uh, Sean, I'll come back to you uh, in just a while. 
but I thought I could hear from people online and people in the room. I'm going to give an opportunity to you, mention your name, but also make your comment or question as brief as you can to get more people to uh, speak back, but also have time for my panel to give closing uh, remarks. All right. Well, thank you very much, Solomon. My name is James Okol. I am the Youth Councillor of Kwania District here in Uganda. Um, I want to start by saying where there are desperate people, there are those people who emerge to come and solve the solution. Um, Africa has, over time, uh, people have been seeing it as it is lagging behind. And when uh, the Europe, the Western, tried to give us their funds and attaching the string, uh, the Chinese and the East thought they could come and give the solution. And that is why we are seeing their footprint in Africa. But to what we don't know, that every other person who has interest in your land has got another hidden agenda. Uh, I would use a proverb that all of them may be putting on the same face, but all of them have the same character. Uh, I am sure that they, the Chinese were once dominated by the whites, and today they want to show the whites that they can overpower them by, one, handling Africa, since there is that projectory report that in, by 2100, Africa will be uh, the habitant of all the world. So they want to be the first people here so that, you know, they could be the champion. Thank you. Thank you. One and the same. Dr. Polly, I think you'll, you'll say something on that. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll get a lady. For, okay, I have Stone there. Um, Stone, I can see you. Yes, Stone. Thank you very much, Solomon. And uh, good morning to everyone. Actually, good afternoon. I think mine is in somewhat agreement with Dr. Apoli that when we lack conversations about the sense of African agency, we will have a conversation about newcomers on the continent. We talk about CGTN, we talk about RT. But who is telling the African story? That if we have failed to build the headquarters of the so-called African Union, I, I can actually bring myself to, to understand how that was possible. The 200 million US dollars had to come from China. So that we lack a sense of agency. Maybe that blunts our ability to even like have conversations like this. I, I find this conversation a bit problematic in a sense that I wish there was a, a representative from the Chinese government here. That oftentimes when the conversation comes up, I ask myself, are we mirroring how, say, Germany or United States would love us to interact with China, that way we are being dictated, or, or uh, there's a dictation of, how do you perceive China? Because what is China doing that the CIA hasn't done? What is China doing that the British soldiers in Nanyuki in Kenya haven't done? Or is it that when the Chinese do it, we expect the headline to be bigger, but somehow we have been either demotivated to assume that if it is done by, say, Americans, that if a coup d'etat is inspired by the CIA, somehow that's okay. The BBC, CNN, they got it wrong with the Iraqi war, that American and British forces went to Iraq on the basis of information that was projected around the world on these same channels. So even when we talk about professionalism, is that something we have consumed over the years, that we, 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 we don't allow ourselves to give that to China? And that's not to say there are no problems with China, but could we open ourselves to the possibility that maybe our definition, our understanding of these people is being dictated by someone else. Thank you. Wow. Interesting perspective to him. All right. I had said the lady. Yeah, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Destiny Gladys Shiger, a member of the Young Professionals Mentorship Program. I think the discussion that I've loved most is about the mindset. I'll give the analogy of a home. All of us belong to a home. And in our homes, we may have things that we don't like and some things that we like. But regardless, that is your home. That is the lineage where you've come from. For the youth, uh, the young people here, 
We have things that we may not like about our continent, about our country, but that is where God has placed us. It is the onus falls on us that the aspects that we see that have not been worked on better, how do we, starting from our individuals and from our small circles, how do we shift our mindsets to a mindset of appreciating and being positive about the things that you see regardless of the other negatives? I believe that what the other countries are doing in terms of Africa is they have identified a gap where most of us may be so negative, maybe because of the prejudice of other people regarding the continent. But in a place where you know your strength, where you appreciate the things that are in your country, you'll be able to move an extra mile to see that the positive things happen. So for the young people who are the leaders of today and also going to occupy those prospective places, offices, the mindset shift starts now, not when you are in those respective places. Thank All right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm called Vicky Namgobe. I'm a youth leader representing the youth of Sri Lanka to the National Youth Council, and I'm also a Polar Lab Fellow. Now, uh, I wanted to just raise two issues concerning resources and cultures and values vis-a-vis -vis the media sector. Now, uh, the new actors that are coming are really using the media and initially, we as Africans, we have our cultures and values that we really are good to us and known to us. But we are finding that with the exposure, with what media is showing about the new actors, our people, especially the young majority of our youth, are losing their identity and are losing their cultures and values. And there is no information that could be sieved out to help out these youth to gain what is theirs and eradicate what is not theirs. So I wanted to inquire if there is a process or a way forward we can do to safeguard what is ours to remain, what is ours, because it, it defines our identities in most cases. Now, as I was listening to the panelists, we spoke about a new ge geopolitical phase where, the, where Africa is gaining more importance and becoming a trade partner. But for me, from my point of view, what I see, we are not becoming like trade partners. There is something called like specialization of labor. They are using us, Africa, as a place of where they can get natural resources, extract it, take them, add value on it, and send them back home. And again, sell us the same products at a very high price, and we end up getting indebted in loans and other activities. So what is the way forward that we can be able also to gain a same level status where we are not only seen as people that uh, producers of natural resources and then they are the manufacturers? How do we be able to safeguard whatever is ours? Thank you so much. All right, I have 15 minutes to go. I'll give just an opportunity to two more people. Um, there's a hand there. Yes, thank you very Maybe much, him. Mr. Solomon. Yeah. My name is Tumwes Derek Collins, and I'm a youth leader from Chiriandong District. Uh, at the same time, an activist. Uh, I happen to be one of the young people that worked with SBC Uganda. That is SBC, the company that is in charge of the Kabale International Airport immediately when I had graduated from here. I had an interaction with one of them who was heading us in our section and he happened to be an Israelite. He told me that the reason as, and we were discussing about the Chinese dominance and other European countries in Africa. He told me the reason as to why we are being domina dominated by these Chinese and other Euro Western countries is because we don't believe in ourselves. We Africans, we know, but we don't believe in ourselves. And it goes back to our leaders. You find that the old president of a country, he cannot offer contracts to the fellow Africans just because they believe we cannot manage and yet we have experts. Every day Makerere here is producing engineers, but no one, you would find, you would find no one is even adding maybe a section in Kavali International Airport, but all the experts who are there, the Israelis, you go on these roads, the Chinese who are not even educated, but someone, is because he's a Chinese, he's a, he has been given a section to head. Before you find that you have the books, you are an expert in that, but the Chinese, 
is the one handling everything because of our ignorance. That's why me, I want to agree with Dr. That it is because of our leaders that we have, that have caused all what is happening in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I may have to close it up, guys. I'm told um, Dr. Stefan wants to go. Um, so I'll give you under 30 seconds, you who has the mic, and then we'll close up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Robert is my name. And uh, I'm very delighted to talk about this. Yes, we talked about uh, the world becoming open to each other in the geopolitics. But as you are dealing with this important question of uh, investment, my question is to those that sit at the boards that negotiate for us as we get these investors. One, I believe that Africans, we have the resources, both the natural resource and the human resource. The only thing that we are failing and lacking out is on how to realize how to get the financial resource, which I believe should not be a problem for many years. Now, where my question comes in, it is, the first, it is not the first time that we are getting foreign investors and the so-called multinational uh, companies. But when they come, all the best they have done for us is set up some infrastructure, take the resources to their home countries, and uh, pay the people who are here and not even occupying significant positions, take Africans for cheap labor, and then at the end of it all, they will say, above all, we have the infrastructure. What have we understood? What have we learned from the past investors? And as the board, what have you learned? Why do you even go ahead to negotiate for new actors on the block if there is no difference? Can we learn how to utilize the chances we have as Africans, devise means of gaining our own finances to run our resources because we have the people to place in those positions? Why should all we right. repeat the same mistake over and over again? All right, thank you. Thank you. 15 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. I, I'm just going to throw two questions to all your panelists. The first one is going to go to Raymond and Sean. Media thrives on the activities and the service of journalists. Without journalists, there will be no media. Now, they have been talking about how media is biased because of the influence that comes from those that fund media and the influence of the editorial board. My question on that is, at what point is the decision made to agree with the editorial board and not the principles of journalism? And what are the things, factors that influence that decision? The second question is going to go to Dr. Kasaija and, and Dr. Stephen. You see, there is a transition from the use of democratic uh, processes to legitimize aristocracy or authoritarianism. Media has been always praised as the fourth arm of the government because of the role it plays in governance. But right now, media through public relations and biased reporting is being used to legitimize uh, authoritarianism. My question therefore is, what are we not doing or what should we be doing to counter that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, we can't continue. But we need to give my panelists um, a round so that they can respond to some of the issues raised. I'll start with Dr. Stefan. Dr. Stefan, you want to respond to some of the views that have been uh, brought up? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> to, to be sure, uh, actually, I have to go. I do not want to go because I, I find the conversation very inspiring and I would really love to be uh, with you longer. But uh, there are other uh, appointments that uh, have actually already started. Um, to, to, to make one thing clear, uh, what uh, I mean to, to bring together actions of the CIA and, um, and, um, um, and, uh, and things of, of the Chinese and, and so on and, and uh, mix this. I mean, by no means uh, anybody of us is going to defend actions of the CIA. And if you, if you remember history, uh, it was Germany uh, and the German government, which was uh, very much against um, this uh, Iraq uh, invasion. And there was a, even a, a, a huge split between uh, Europe and, and the United States uh, on that matter. Um, and um, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the credibility of the United States as a whole uh, suffered a lot uh, uh, from, from, uh, from these actions and from, uh, I mean, just lately, uh, Colin Powell died and one of his uh, biggest regrets in his life, he mentioned, was 
that he uh, believed uh, his own uh, CIA and and was put on the uh, uh, in 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 the UN uh, Security Council to to give this presentation uh, that we all remember. Um, there was a question by by uh, one lady. Uh, the question: What is the way forward? And uh, how? Yeah, what what can be done uh, in order to to uh, to to get real advancements? And I mean, for for me, it is real development aid. And uh, real. What do I mean with real development aid? I mean that development aid that is going to uh, to uh, uh, which is providing um, resources and uh, and profits the the, uh, the 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 common people and is not just going uh, to to um, to to corrupt officials or uh, uh, is hidden in in pockets that um, that nobody knows where they are and that the that the people uh, of your countries can profit really from the richness of of your countries i mean of course but that does that does uh, it is very absolutely necessary for that that you have accountability and transparency uh, uh, as the as the, the money flows and uh, dependencies are, are concerned. And that is also the reason why sometimes um, development aid from Western countries are so much harder to get or are, are take so much longer to be, to be, uh, um, 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 yeah, to be um, distributed because if, Lots of money is given, going from one hand to another. There has to be accountability and uh, transparency, and the media uh, should have the opportunity to look into that. And uh, and people should be responsible, taken responsible for accepting the money and how they use this money. And this is, for me, uh, actually the the only way to to do this. Thank you. Dr. Stephen Frederick, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause before he goes. Thank you very much for your contribution. We really are grateful. He is the director of the Sub-Saharan Africa at the CAS headquarters. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Um, I just want to bring uh, Sean in. Sean Osimbe, a couple of questions came through with the media. You just want to react to those? Yes. Um, what I would like to say, what we have uh, gotten from this conversation, the biggest actor right now on the African continent is China. So we're talking about Africa's depend dependency on China. And uh, just a quick history as I wrap up is that China is attracted to Africa because of the natural resources and the export markets. And uh, it, them being in Africa has been met with the skepticism. But come to think of it, the governments have been uh, the government officials have been very, very overwhelmingly positive, uh, but the people on the ground are still doubting. Why are they doubting? Because there's one thing that is lacking in Africa, and that is education. There are no governments that have gone that are going out there to tell the people, this is what we are getting from China, and this is what China are getting from us. There's lack of so much information, and this is what is bringing so much doubt um, when it comes to people trusting uh, the Chinese out here. So that, that and, and, and also see what, what uh, when it comes to exports, as I was talking, the export markets and the natural resources, just quickly, let's talk about Angola, which is uh, one case that is very, very alarming. Um, since it is estimated that around 75% of the Chinese debt, the total Chinese debt, I think they have the higher Chinese debt uh, in Africa, uh, they, are, they secure it back through their oil exports. And that is such a big natural resource. So you can imagine what that does to the Angolan community and because of the lack of education maybe or because of how the loans came about and the government officials they were just happy oh so much money and they didn't get to think it through and maybe the media maybe the media didn't present it to the people over there on on what the risk is when taking uh 
taking over this money is what has caused all this doubt and all that. So I think uh, to just answer two questions from the lady, uh, what needs to be done, I'll, I'll support Dr. Stefan, is the government officials need to take responsibility. People need to get out there and talk to and educate the masses on what exactly is happening with this new, you know, new big players in the, in the, in, on the continent. Like, what exactly are we getting? It's not that, oh, oh yes, the money is here, but in real sense, uh, most of that money is being uh, maybe, you know, cor corruption is taking over and we are not even seeing the money get to the, to the systems because maybe China do not have a harsh policy when it comes to accounting for the money. So the education needs to be out there. And as the media, I know it's really tough. And uh, the part, I know that the, the, the guy was asking about the media, the, the journalist values. What happens is that most journalists across Africa, they tend to emulate their counterparts in Europe. And uh, most of this uh, top uh, European uh, mainstream channels have not provided the training. So what China did is they came and saw that gap and actually penetrated into that gap. And you know that they started taking advantage of, you know, let's go training, but in real sense, they know the agenda they are pushing. So for, 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 for that part, most individuals, you know, when they go there, they feel like maybe they're obliged to, to continue following the Chinese way of doing things. But at the end of the day, that's not being a true journalist because when you're a journalist, you need to know that you have to be you know, honest, you have to be fair, you don't have to be biased, you have to tell both sides of the story. So I think that comes down to individuals. You, you, you check yourself from inside out and get to see, is this working for my people? Because at the end of the day, you might just be taking the money, you might be attracted to the technology, and but you, you're not seeing what you're doing to the future generations. So I think as an individual point of view, just to ask yourself those questions and take it into um, account all these things. And, and, and this is what I'm saying, making a breakthrough in, the, in, the, in this news arena, uh, that is the broadcasting side, it just requires, it requires more than a generous you know, package of money and technology. And uh, people just need to think twice about uh, the lives of other Africans. They need the government officials, the journalists, we need to think twice, right. is it worth it? Or are we drowning further when it oh. comes to this new industry? Sean, thank you. Sean Simba, thank you very much for answering some of those questions. Dr. Puli, I, I would love you to particularly uh, talk back to Stone, Songa Samuel, who raised the issues, among others, and our discussions influenced, you know, against China. You know, he, he raised a couple of is issues there. Um, and you know, you want to speak about some of the views um, that have been raised, Dr. Poli? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the for the questions and the comments. Um, who is telling the African story? I think this is a very fundamental, you know, fundamental question that we need to raise. Um, but we need to tell our story. Uh, my friend here talks about an Israeli asking him that we, or telling him that we don't believe in ourselves. I don't know about you, but me, I believe in myself. Um, I don't know about others. Um, so this issue, this whole is about, you know, we don't believe in ourselves and we cannot uh, make a contribution. I think it's just absolute, absolute rubbish. Um, the other thing is um, on the issue of the, of the uh, as a way of really of a conclusion on this, uh, because there are so many things that are being said. Um, the issue of, um, these new players taking up um, our assets, for example. Uh, I know the Russians have opened up, the, because of Russian investment in Central African Republic, uh, they have even reached the point of where they have opened up police stations for themselves. Um, I have seen this also in Zambia uh, with the Chinese, where they opened up a police station for themselves. You know. so, so, but, but the issue is then, uh, why do we allow this? Why do our leaders allow this? Um, are we being sacrificed at the altar because at the altar of cheap, of, of, of cheap money? Uh, but then also the, ch the Chinese money is not cheap uh, because the concessional loans, it's very difficult these days to get concessional loans uh, of 1%, 3%, uh, which normally would be given by multilateral institutions like IMF and World Bank. Uh, when we go to China, actually it is we get these loans at a commercial rate. Uh, so I really don't know uh, how far we can go in terms of acquiring this debt or acquiring the debts uh, and how far we, are, we can pay this we, we can pay this 
But also fundamentally, and this is my really my last, my last issue, is the, why is it that has the democracy experiment failed? Uh, because if we say the Europeans were here for a very long time, uh, they colonized us, how can I allow myself now to be colonized by the Chinese? How can we allow ourselves to be colonized by the Chinese? Uh, then there's a fundamental problem that maybe I normally argue and say, I think there's a problem with our skin. Uh, you are colonized by the Europeans and you didn't accept it. Then how can you now accept the Ch Chinese colonization? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, and I really don't have an answer to this. But, but where is it and where is what I read, uh, the narrative that I see? Uh, I used to be a very big fan, by the way, of CGTN, uh, African News. Uh, every 8 p.m., they have a whole hour on African, on African affairs. And their, and their coverage is fantastic. Uh, I used to be a very big fan. Although, of course, now I know there are other uh, TV stations with uh, African news which have even a better coverage than the, the CGTN. Um, but the point here is, in all this, yes, we've had these new players, uh, new old, of course, new old. Um, but I think as Africans, we should not stand for to be recolonized. Uh, this is out of question, I think. Uh, but our leaders seem to have accepted the fact that they need to get this money. We are talking about the development narrative. Um, we have abandoned the Washington consensus. Now we are in Beijing consensus. Um, so I don't know. So Solomon, I don't have the answers. Possibly they lie with these people here. I don't <laughs> know. Very many questions, less answers. Raymond, you have the final say, then I can wrap it up. <coughs> um, so I'm, I'm a skeptic, and please don't stone me for the things I'm about to say. What is Africa? Um, we're 54 different countries. Um, millions of different tribes. Uganda and Rwanda don't agree the border from Rwanda is closed. Um, the Kenyans don't want our chicken, they don't want our maize, they are blocking our milk. Um, the Tanzanians are fighting the Burundians. The biggest population of Africa is in West Africa. They probably speak French and uh, uh, native languages. None of the East Africans speak it. Um, the South Africans who have the biggest control of the economy do not consider themselves as African. So as North Africans, the Tunisians, the Algerians do not think that they belong to the African project. So I start my question by asking the African elite, what is this Africa that you speak of? Because it doesn't seem our projection of what Africa is and what Africa actually is are separate entities. The colonial project which we always blame for ruining Africa, lasted about 250 to 300 years uh, in Africa. Um, Self-governance before the colonial project and after the colonial project has been much longer than that. So there's also a crisis on African leadership. It's not just a crisis of the people colonizing us. Um, and, and that's where we need to start by asking the questions. One, this Africa project we speak of, what is it? Um, can a young student from Tunisia come to Makerere, access an education, and get a job in Uganda? Is that possible in this lifetime? If it's not possible, then Project Africa itself is still something that's being defined. Um, and the other question is the question of travel, because travel also has a lot to do with our identities. Um, there are some African countries where honestly I'm invited to and I turn down Tunisia, Libya, I have to fly to France to be able to come back to an African continent. And the question is really on what are these barriers? If you say that we are one people, why can't I go to Rwanda right now? If you say we are one people, why can't I, who is natively from Toro, who is a, from a cattle herding generation, why can't I sell my milk in Kenya? Why is it being blocked by the Kenyan government? So the, the first fundamental is there is no existence of Africa. There is an impression created within the minds of the black people that there is something called Africa to which we belong. That impression hasn't been realized. So can we realize the impression before we create an aspiration for it? Um, the second point is in the creation of an aspiration for the young African elite, you must be open to the fact that there are civilizations which are way older than Africa, with much longer histories, 
and they could have dominion by virtue of their foreign policies on Africa. So you have to be open to the fact that you may not be colonized, but there may be actors who work within your country that you need to work with. Um, and it's not just, today we are complaining about China colonizing Africa, but in 15,000 BC, Greece went and colonized half of uh, South Asia. Um, there was Portuguese conquest over the Chinese uh, populations. There was Portuguese conquest over Africa. So if you roll this world about 2,500 years back, you realize that the Portuguese were the actors then. Today they are not actors, they are not even in this room. They are not having this conversation with us. So can Africa, if we realize this idea of Africa, can we then plan for say a thousand years in which we can also come back in this room and have the French, the Germans, the British saying, we don't want an African conquest over us. Because we clearly see we have the numbers, we have the resources, we just lack the leadership. We just have, honestly, let's face it, we have a very bogus leadership. After a hundred years of civilization that this education has created for our leaders, they are unable to just unpack basic state building. In Uganda, basic state building has failed. You don't have a functional state that's providing education, health. Imagine, basics, health and education. You can't educate your people, you can't feed them, you can't treat them. So are they your people? That's where the question of identity comes in. If someone feeds you and educates you and gives you a shelter, that person is your father, that person is your friend, that person is someone you can relate with. So as we question the colonial project, I also want us to question this leadership project over Africa because the leaders we have today were the Marxists of yesterday, the Yoe Museveni's, the Paul Kagame's, um, Bia, Paul Bia's, uh, those are the leaders who created this idea of Africa can be a, a, a state, it can yeah. be one state, we can all natively work within this civilization. They fail to realize that. So perhaps for the young people in this room, you have a lot of time. That's the advantage that you have over old people. You can sit down now and wait it out. The people who are leading us today won't lead us 25 years from now. But what are you doing in these 25 years to build this level of civilization that if tomorrow one of us in this room happened to be the president of Uganda, how different would you treat the question of state building? How different would you treat the question of actors? How different would you relate with the US? How different would you relate with China? Yeah. And, and, and those are not things they teach you in school. Those are things you learn by civilizing yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, Raymond Mujuni. <laughs> We're talking about the West and the East, the old and the new. What happened to us? Is it time for, her, for us to start the discussion of Afrocentrism, Africanacity, Africa for us, by us, and with us? And Raymond is questioning the very existence of Africa. Maybe we need to start there. Maybe we need to start thinking about that. We are thinking of the Africa continental free trade area. About 1.6 billion people having one market. Guess what? It was a struggle to get countries to sign. We were supposed to begin trading in January. We haven't yet started. Tanzania has not offered its tools to the African Union. But whilst we're even thinking about <laughs> the Africa continental free trade area, the East African Common Market Protocol, Raymond said we're struggling, having conversations with Rwanda. Tanzania, Kenya rejected Tanzania's products. They had 63 cases, and they've only resolved 42. And they're saying before they finish up everything, they have to sort everything right. Kenya rejected our milk, our maize, because they are thinking that we are importing our sugar from Brazil and repackaging it. Maybe whilst we are discussing the issues around the new authoritarian regimes, the West, the East, maybe this is the opportunity for us to start thinking about us. 
maybe we need to start a conversation around Africanacity. Africa for us by us. And maybe it's time for us to do that road plan that Raymond is saying from now to 50 years on. What is going to happen to us as a continent? Good afternoon. Another big round of applause for this wonderful, phenomenal, extreme panel. What we need to do as a continent is to structure the relationship. Uh, let's have a structured conversation around what China can do for us and also what we can do, what we can do for the Chinese. I mean, it does no harm because we live in this world. All of us are there. I mean, the Chinese are there, the Russians are there, the Turks are there, and the opportunities, and we're looking for opportunities. So for me, what we need to do as a continent is to structure a relationship so that it's a win-win, it's a win-win thing. Oh, of course, we need to tell our stories because for a very long time, our story has been told by someone else. Uh, so we need to tell our own stories, meaning what do I mean by telling the story? The things that are happening and the things that we are doing. And especially promote the African agency in all this. Um, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? But that can only come from us uh, if we tell the story. Not someone else defining the narrative. Um, because this is what for a long time has been happening. You hear of the narrative of Africa rising. It's not the African who is saying it. It's someone else who is saying it. And here I'm talking about both the traditional and the new players. Uh, so even these Western countries, um, I'll just give you a very simple example. Uh, out of the problems of 2008, the credit crunch, they established something called a G20, the group of 20. The group of 20 also includes the European Union. So why don't we also include the African Union in the group of 20? Because we have emerging markets. Uh, the fastest growing five economies in the world, uh, you have the majority are in Africa. So why can't we also be part of the of the conversation when we are at the high table. Because at the end of the day, you remember, if you are not at the high table, then you become the menu, uh, then you are eaten. Uh, we should be at the high table so that we define what we want and, 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 and see our priorities, uh, you know, and state our priorities. You know, the African leadership, of course, as we said, the African leadership has issues. Um, because for, we, have been, we have been independent for the last 60 years. African integration has been around since 1963. But we could go back up to, well, 100 years back, uh, because if you go back to Pan-Africanism. So we had African integration. We built these institutions. But the African leadership seemed to be, seemed to be failing, uh, was, seemed to have failed us. Uh, why do I say this? Uh, every bad thing that people want to define is on this continent. Uh, but is it, is it necessarily correct? Is it, is it true? Uh, but, but because these are our leaders, they are supposed to be the, the face of Africa. Uh, they are our face. Uh, and so whatever, is, whatever wrong is taking place on the continent is attributed to the leadership, um, which, may be actually, which may be actually true because um, we built these institutions. Um, and I'll also give you another example. We transformed the OAU into the African Union. We thought that African Union would be more vibrant, more qualitative and quantitatively. Has it worked for the last 20 years? Let's just make a, let's just make a look at the balance sheet. Uh, we have created norms, we have created institutions, we have created programs. Uh, but if you do look at those programs, these are not really functioning the way they were envisaged to function. So what are we doing wrong? And I think this is a question for African leadership. There should be introspection. Look at, look, let's look at ourselves. Inward looking, say, look, what have we done wrong? Because at the end of the day, we have something called Agenda 2063. The Africa we want in the next 50 years. So this Africa we want, we want an integrated Africa which is peaceful, an Africa which is at peace with itself, an Africa which is economically developed, an Africa which can send a person to the moon. Now, in the next 50 years, so this Agenda 2063, how far have we gone? This is about, it's coming to 10 years since that declaration was done. What have we done? So, so it's basically what I'm saying is this, that the African leadership requires an introspection. Sit down, look at ourselves, yes, there are issues which are coming up in terms of reform proposals, uh, for example, which have been put forward. But I think actions speak louder than words. What the African citizen want is to see action. Reduction in poverty, let's look at the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 of them. How far are we on the trajectory to achieving those Sustainable Development Goals? Then we'll know where Africa is and where we want to go. Even as an African citizen, we should have agents, we should have our own agents in terms of what we do in our small spaces on, you know, on trying to develop the continent because at the end of the day, nobody else is going to come and develop this thing. And as we have heard from our panel, 
these guys who when they come here they are looking for resources they are looking for money they are look to take away uh, i don't think it is really an altruistic kind of you know relationship where they mean well for us uh, and i don't see the difference between the old and the new they are all the same they are all the same uh, the old and the new they are all the same whether it was european colonization and the chinese they are all the same uh, this is what i'm saying so at the end of the day it is us it requires african agency uh, the african we need to take action ourselves and we can only do that when we organize uh, but because of this disorganization, 55 African countries divided by language, divided by ethnicity, divided by practically everything else. And we are just fighting over spoils. I don't even know why would we fight because of, because of the language. The uh, Lusophone, the Francophone, the Anglophone, I don't know. All the phones of this world. Uh, everything is here. Uh, so, but we need to really to go back to the basics and, uh, and put ourselves together.